1041, which is fab. So if it's 1041, we, we, we can finish early. Wow, brilliant. Okay. So. Good. So, Henry, so you haven't got any other news for us, and nor have you got, no? No. Right. No. So. One one of the things that one of the things that we started off with on Tuesday was that one of one of the group asked not about the subject that we're doing now. They they asked about the they asked about the prehistoric timeline, the British prehistoric timeline, and I think the best thing to do is to look at that straight away to sort of get some chronology, uh, and you you will find that. When we look at prehistoric archaeology in Switzerland as a comparison, the date range is very different. So I sort of decided two things earlier on in the week before Tuesday. Um, one of the things it would be wise just to look at the prehistoric period in terms of dates rather than periods. And we will do it that way because if we're like comparing archaeology with Switzerland that might have a different prehistoric period for the Mesolithic starting and ending than, than ours. And what makes it even more confusing is that I've got my own timeline, which is slightly different um, from the norm. And I'll explain what there is now. So I think we'll get straight onto this prehistoric timeline and we'll just we'll just go on to it and a word of warning for goth this week we we don't have as many images as normal and simply because i just want to flow and explain theories in regards to the swiss lake villages and it will come out by the end that they're not lit villages at all they're, they're buildings that have been built in one spot over a long period of time. Well, when archaeologists find loads of postals, they immediately think it's a village, but, but people have been living in those spots for a considerable length of time. And that's why we get lots of rebuilds and postals and stuff. But we'll come to that anyway. Hopefully this chart is going to be big enough for, for you, both of you to see. And this is, this is me scribbling this on um, at the back of my diary. And there are some red her herrings in this list and I'm wondering if you can spot them so there are there are, there are there's three red herrings and we won't start off with the first one so when when we looked at the the timetable and I will mention that we'll be doing we'll look at interglacials and all that type of stuff next week and by the way next week we're looking at the Latoli footprints from the um, from Tanzania, and we'll be at, at the um, the Rift Valley in Tanzania, so the, the discovery of the leaky. So we'll be doing that next week, and we'll do, be also looking at Haysborough, Happisburg, if you want to call it, on the East Anglian coastline, and so footprints there. So that's what we're going to be doing next week. So we're going to be going way back into prehistory. So that'll take us into, on this chart, onto the Paleolithic period, but into the, um, into the lower Paleolithic period rather than the upper Paleolithic period. We don't want to add them to the chart at this minute. Now, in archaeology, in archaeology, if this is uh, the first red herring on this chart, in archaeology, we... We, we we like dates, so the word the number forty three at the end of the chart there. What's wrong with that date forty three? What what should that date be? What's wrong with that date forty three? So you don't know, right? Okay, no. it's not for, it's not forty three years ago that um, the Roman era started. In fact, it's AD forty three which is just under 2,000 years ago. So in other words, that date itself should be a lot greater than the number 43. So that's 43 AD. Now, I put that in date form on here because it's a specific date. 
is a specific date that marks the beginning of the Roman era. It doesn't per se mean the end of the prehistoric era in Britain, because in parts of Scotland, um, for a very long time, they remain in the prehistoric period. In fact, the brochs on the island of, islands of Shetland and Orkney and in the top part of Scotland, those brochs themselves uh, remain in this prehistoric period and they, they never visited by the Roman era. So this is why we initially find a problem when we use the word eras and Iron Ages, Neolithic and Mesolithic, because in the Iron Age, they're still using flint. In the Bronze Age, they're still using copper. The Bronze Age are still using uh, flint as well. So sometimes this sort of way of looking at periods is very, very much outdated. There's another red herring alongside it, if you could spot it. But we'll come on to that later on. So no more red herrings. So Paleolithic period. So we could say that that begins, that, that ends 12,000 years ago. And that gives, gives us into the Mesolithic period. And I know we've already done this, but it's good to sort of recap and sort of firm it into our minds. So 12,000 years ago, we got the Mesolithic period, a clear change, a clear, clear demarcation. And what that demarcation is, is that the, the Paleolithic period, the, the, glace, the big, long glacial period has ended in Britain in particular. So that's 12,000 years ago. But when you compare that with Switzerland, for example, guess what? They still got glaciers in, in Switzerland. So by marking the end of glaciation in Switzerland with the Mesolithic period is the wrong thing to do because they still got ice sheets. But for us, our Mesolithic period begins 12,000 years ago with the melting of the ice, with the retreating of the ice, which is very, very important. Now, I sat back and I agonized. It was, it was a bit of an agonization last week. And I thought, have, have, I, have I misled everybody into something? And what that was, was that when you get your copies of ancient Britain, when that's all done and dusted, we're still sourcing all the copies of ancient Britain, by the way. Um, in, that, in that book, it basically says that the beginning of the Neolithic period is 6,250 years ago. And I sat down and I thought, I don't like that date. And the reason why I don't like that date, it don't make any sense. And the reason why it doesn't make any sense is because there's no marks in the sand. But there is a mark in another level of sand. The level of sand is 8,500 years ago. What we do know is that Britain become disconnected from Europe. It was a slow, agonizing process that Dogland Bight becomes submerged with water. But again, that's another lecture. But 8,500 years ago, that's when the, my end of the Mesolithic period, and that's beginning of my Neolithic period, because there's a mark in the sand. There's a huge difference. There, there, there's basically, we've become disconnected. The flora and fauna that we got here is the flora and fauna that we're going to have for thousands of years with no real changes other than a few voles ending up in Orkney a little bit later and a few other animals being added like uh, rabbits and so on. But other than that, the mark in the sand is the division between Europe and Great Britain. And strangely enough, I'm sure, and I'm not going to make a joke out of this, it's a serious issue. Uh, in, in a few years' time, um, we will mark Britain as, as, as having... Um, a pre-Brexit period and a post-Brexit period. We are now in the post-Brexit period. And I reckon that historians are going to use that as a marker. We're no longer part of the European Union. That's our date in the sand. And our date in the sand here from my list of dates, the beginning of the Neolithic period is 8,500 years ago. But there's, if you look at the bot, if you look at the little chart there, um, overlapping between my Mesolithic and the Neolithic period that begins 8,500 years ago. In other words, habitation and animal hus husbandry. Now, there's a point to be made here. Some archaeologists believe that the beginning of the Neolithic Britain in properly, their Neolithic begins 6,250 years ago because we got more animals being, uh, we got more domesticated sheep and we got more domesticated dogs and we got more domesticated this and we got uh, more types of barley and all of them and the rest of it but all these things already existed here so my mark in the sand is 8,500 years ago that's beginning my, my neolithic 
Also, another departure from the date range is is I've I've basically put a little bit of a line there. This is eight. This is four thousand five hundred years ago. So, in other words, my Neolithic period lasts four thousand years, which is quite a long Neolithic period. But do you know, when I look at this, I think, well, you know, we've got we've got evidence of causeway enclosures, those weird sort of strange type of sites that go back um go back uh, six seven thousand years you know they, they they go into this sort of period that i'm talking about right so weird things called causeway enclosures which we'll come on to and we'll come to love them on that day on that there you've got my copper age now i never use a copper age i don't use it it's it's a it's an age i don't use but i'm being arrogant um i'm being dismissive so i need to have a copper age because I don't like calling the Copper Age the Beaker Period. Don't like the name Beaker Period because it sort of indicates that waves of people come over from Europe um, and they they waft away earlier civilization. I don't like that. What I like is the name Copper Age. Um, and you don't usually see it in many books, but on the continent, you do. You do see the Copper Age being used all the time on the continent. Switzerland, Cyprus, 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 Copper, the island of Copper. You see the Copper Age being used in Europe. Why can't we use it? In Europe, they call it the Chalcolithic period. I'm not going to be as adventurous as that, folks. I'm not going to call it the Chalcolithic period. We're going to call it the Copper Age. Um, and it's a period of transition between the use of flint and the, <coughs> coming, the coming of tin and copper, which makes bronze 4,100 years ago. So this is the thing. That 4,100 years ago, that Bronze Age, that's the, that's the one you'll see in books. I agree with that. That's in the book. And you'll actually see the Copper Age marked in the books as a Beaker period. But I just call it the Copper Age because it makes it easy. Because you've basically got Mesolithic, Neolithic, Copper, Bronze, Iron Age. Um, note the second red herring. Um, Paleolithic means um, beginning. Um, and what does Mesolithic mean? Does um, Paleolithic mean beginning? Neolithic means new. Meso, um, does that mean the period of meat? The meat, meat lithic period, is that what that means? Is that the red herring? Yeah, it is. It meso means middle. Mesolithic, um, not the period of meat. The Mesolithic, meso, Mesoamerica, middle middle mesoamerica so it's the middle period very good having a middle period middle period of making flint neolithic going all the way to the bronze age not much more to say about the bronze age we'll come to that when we come to it it's fine in the next few months love it excellent don't have a problem with that but then what you do find is that you've got the iron age 750 ah what's wrong with that henry what's wrong with 750 It's obvious, uh, Henry. It should be 2007. Yeah, it doesn't go back far enough. Yeah, it doesn't go. Why didn't you say that? There's, I, had there's turn, been a... I had to turn my microphone on. <laughs> oh, what an absolute effort. Oh, didums. Oh, fine. I feel sorry for you. Sorry. Um, so that should be 2000, 2,750 um, years ago. That's the beginning of our Iron Age. And then as as right 2750 years ago now one other thing i need to say before we go on to the swiss stuff we've done we've done that roman date which is wrong that's 43 a.d now the problem is right we we say 2750 years ago iron age right and that's from that's from today's date right but as the years go by if you use that roman date as um Say, for example, that date 43 um, AD, right? So what we do, we go to the year, um, we go to the year 2043, right? So that means we can put a two in front of that. So that's 2043 years before 2043, right? But it'll soon be 2044 and it'll be two. And so in other words, what happens, um, that, date, that date's always going to be wrong, 43 2043 that date's always going to be wrong right so we put ad in front of that we say 43 ad but the other dates are fine you can you know 
2,750 Iron Age, it's not really precise anyway. People didn't wake up that day and suddenly say, oh, whippy, whoopee do, we've just left Europe, you know, or, or, or we never just left Europe um, overnight, did we? It took bloody ages. But, but the fact of the matter is... Um, the people didn't wake up and and um and say oh wicked it's 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 uh, it's um i don't know it's the iron age right and they certainly didn't wake them wake up and say well um it's 750 years before the birth of christ um except what we do have we do have coins on them that say um that we we, we do have coins on them that say 750 years bc no i'm only kidding with you but that's the point you see we we don't we we don't actually have we don't actually have um, um, you, th there's not a specific date for the beginning of the Iron Age. There isn't a specific date. Um, who's to say that somebody didn't come across um, meteoric rock and start banging it on an anvil or something? Because am am anvils did anvils did did exist. Um, they 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 would have been stone anvils or or something hard, and they may have thought, oh right, this is a meteoric meteoric rock it's hard it's hard it is and then you know they might have heated up and they might have had iron earlier we don't know we we, we really really don't know um and that, that that's where we get the idea of uh, um you know the stone in regards to king arthur the uh, uh, an iron sword coming out of the stone so that, that that's a very very important point so that's that done. I wanted to do that because I had a couple of people on Tuesday saying, look, we don't really understand these dates. We don't get it. We, we, um, we don't we don't we don't really understand what's going on. And um, so so that's why I wanted to do it. And it just sort of gives a lot more clarity. And also next week, we're not going to just be doing the word interglacial. We're going to be used. We're going to be looking again at the terminologies. Uh, terminus post cram and terminus anti cram the beginning of something and the end of something right so we we'll do that and also next week we'll be doing looking at those sets of footprints so i just got a lot to get in really so okay what we'll do we'll, we'll go we'll, we'll go back to that and what we'll do we'll look at these images so now this is rather this is rather interesting um, there are lots of lakes in Switzerland. It's a, it's a, it's a it's a lake country, and what what they have been finding finding in the lakes, um, Lake Geneva and so on is is just um, they, they've they've been that they found oh my god you know wow wicked love it they they've actually found stakes um, that represent um, the stakes and the foundations of buildings that were raised. Um, in the muddy waters of, of these lakes in Switzerland. Nobody chose to question this. Yes, nobody chose to question this. Big question mark. So that's one of our questions. Nobody chose to question this when they were, when they were being found. Um, you know, when, when people were first coming across these decades and decades and decades ago. Um, nobody thought to question, you know, the, these lake villages within, within the lakes. Right. Big question mark. Leave that there. The other point as well is, is that they started to find loads of posts and, and post holes and stuff. And then the archaeologist said, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. This is actually evidence of villages that were actually built on the lake. Right. Big question mark. Um, you know, a statement. Um, so we've got we got two two things to actually look at there. And, and both of those assumptions have turned out to be wrong. And we'll go on to why. Yeah, but not yet. So it's it's always that sort of sense. So we've got all these sort of um, artifacts being found on various sites. And and also, this is another red herring, a canoe. Now, now I've said it, I said a moment ago that the image that we just see indicates that people sort of lived above the lakes. Um, like the likes of Lake Stikaka um, in, in the Americas, where, where they got lake villages uh, and, um, and, and so on. And so we think, right, two question marks we, we came up with, and then we come up with this. And obviously um, the, the canoe is evidence that uh, people lived on the lakes. So that's the third assumption. But let's just not answer 
for the other two, but this will give the answer anyway. Uh, uh, there would there were lakes around back then, but it doesn't mean to say people actually lived on them. That that's basically thrown away what we're, what we're going to get at, um, because ice melts and lake levels rise. Stop. So yeah, they would have needed canoes, but not necessarily indicative of the fact that they actually lived on the lakes, um, per se. Evidence completely. So, um, what what they what they found is actually as they started to lake the, excavate the lake beds, they've actually found out that actually, oh, there's, <laughs> there's evidence of grasses and there's evidence of hards on the. Hang on a minute. So, so there's lev- evidence of hards on the lake bed. The last time I looked, you can't light a fire underwater um, and have a group of people sat around eating food. So that's what they started to find, right? So there you go. And so what we got there, so we sort of click on and we've got lots of evidence. We've got lots of evidence. Now this this is this is away from the evidence that we actually find um, areas where we're t- particularly these lake villages are not just found in, in, in Switzerland, so in other localities. We actually find peat bogs and various other localities within sort of uh, Europe, with the old Yugoslavia as well, and Austria. And the point is, is that when you start finding snakes and so on in these peat bogs and so on, you immediately presume that uh, people lived above the peat bogs and stuff. Um, or uh, it might be because there was a lake here once and water levels lot dropped and it's the reverse of what we were trying to get at a few moments ago. So you can't always presume based on you can't always presume based on what's there today that the environment was like that in the past. Now, this is a reconstruction vis-a-vis of what they once believed that these mm, lake villages look like. There's two buildings there, Lake Village. Right. Um, uh, more than two buildings make a village. Job done. Easy one there. But we, but we, but you can see that these these are. This is clearly built above the, the lake. And I, I was reminded on Tuesday of the lecture that I offered ages ago in regards to the Cranog. And we looked at uh, a couple of examples of cranogs in Cymru, Wales. Um, we looked at loads of cranogs in Ireland and a couple in Scotland and so on, the Orkneys. And and these these the cranogs themselves are artificial islands. Easy, easy boy. And, and we basically said that maybe you've got cranogs on a lake because they're there because it makes easy it makes it easier to fish. It's it's like a defensive thing. Uh, you can sort of insulate these things better. They're going to be away from packs of wild wolves. Um, you build on a lake because there's nowhere else to live because all the land is being occupied. But most of what I'm saying would not be the same with Switzerland because remember, these are actually being built thousands and thousands of years before we start. We, we, we look at the Cranogs, which date to 2000, 2000 a bit years ago. These date to three, 4,000 years ago. Yeah. So, We've same. I, I absolutely loathe this idea of defence. I, I I get very upset when people say, you know, what we've got, we've got, we've got this and that because it's built this way because of defence. And it really upsets me because there's no imagination. For example, uh, hill forts. They they always say that hill forts have got these huge banks and ditches for defence. And you start to think. You start to think, hang on, the, the one at Maiden Castle is 50 acres in area. And to walk around it takes a good 10 minutes. And you start to think to defend Maiden Castle, you're gonna need you're gonna need literally hundreds, if not a thousand individuals to defend it, right? Why build something so big you can't really defend it? And you, you start to your mind starts to open and say, were, were they actually for defensive reasons, or were they for something else like status or the or- or to keep animals out and all these different things. So you see, you've got to be really objective and really sort of, um, so keep this image in your mind. This is, this is, is this an archaeological mirage or is, this is based on something. This is based on the archaeology. 
But then, oh, this really slaps us across the face, doesn't it? Yeah, there's another archaeo- there's, there's there's other archaeologists going with the evidence to saying, look at this. Wow. So, right, let, let's just uh, those two question mark statements earlier on. When they when they were excavating these and finding these, they're actually finding them underwater. And the obvious, and um, one of the obvious things now is is that water level rose. So when the buildings were actually within these sort of um, we're on these lake bed confines, we know that in the past they weren't right. They 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 weren't within these sort of um, most most of them would have been completely on dry land like this or basically on the edges of the lakes. Um, and the other thing as well is, can you see one building there? Can you see any others? Nope, there's just one. Oh, right, all right. So it's not a village. No, it's not a village. So they're not lake villages. No, the lake dwellings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the other thing. What, what happened, because they were in ideal situation, and there's another point there, we got, we got an annex on this as well. Because they're on an ideal situation, People decided that they would, they would build on here over and over again, and you know, as you know, timber rots. We do find that with some buildings like this, they might fire the end of the post. Um, I I tried to do that with the roundhouse, but I thought, well, what's the point in doing that? Because they're they're already tapered and they're treated, and I only want this thing to stand for about six, seven, ten years, and then then we can just set light to it or pull the whole thing down and use the timber for something else. So they, they, people knew when they were building these that they wouldn't stand forever. So they weren't part of a village. So you've got the evidence over time that uh, people, are, um, people are very much sort of rebuilding in the same spot because that's, that they, built, they built this here because it was the place that they wanted to build it. Like, why build somewhere else? Do you know what I mean? This did completely different to the Amazon rainforest where, where people just stayed in one place and they used to move around in the Amazon rainforest. And then, and then you think, oh, why was it abandoned? Ooh, why was it abandoned? They must have been because there was waves of people coming around, you know, killing them and everyone was wiped out. So if, if that's the case, then why are we still alive today if everyone's been killed in the past? Don't like that one. The obvious answer to why they abandoned the buildings was because the water level was rising and it just didn't suit what they wanted anymore. Easy answer. And then we start to think about the the village that they found that they found near Peterborough called Must Farm. This village that they found at Peterborough, there was all this talk that that you know, the buildings were set alight and there were still bowls of food on the table and and they have basically found very little evidence of human remains there and, 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 and all these other things, yeah. And and people came up with a theory, oh, they, they, they felt threatened, so they decided to set light to their homes and disappear or somebody got to the village like Lord of the Rings and, and the, the men of the mountains decided to set light to everybody and stuff, well... Or maybe they just set light to the buildings. They didn't want to live anymore there anymore because, what in that in that sense, right? What we do think is the reverse of what we're saying now. Because there, the water level had dropped so much that it was like a boggy, marshy, horrible, inclement, um, fly-ridden landscape. So why would you want to live there anymore? So just set light to it, right? Well, this is the different way around. Water levels still rising. So this is all good stuff so uh moving on again another image um, so what what we've got well, i could do just have a bit of a chronology about switzerland in a moment so, so that there is very different from that so now what i've got to do as well i've got to be very careful what i'm telling you right and i'm going to be very careful from what i'm telling you because this is what i've said however we can't we can't dismiss the fact that there may have also been villages. We can't say that everything's the same in archaeology. So how dare I give that impression? So I'm not going to backtrack. 
I'm going to say most of the evidence tells us that these these were individual buildings, but there must have been occasion where people just decided to put houses alongside each other. And that looks that looks quite cozy. If you've got a nice insulated floor level, right, you've got access to fish. And but the other problem is building something like this, that as water level rises, folks. Yeah. That's going to have to go as well because people ain't going to live there. So. You know, it, it, it's, it's that type of genre of archaeology that we, we sort of got to be very careful with. And when you look at that, when you look at that and you look at something like that, that might be an earlier building. So what they've simply done, they, they put the beams all the way to the base. They put the beams to the roof to make an apex. Job done. Bob's your uncle. Fanny's your aunt. Put a doorway in there um, and you've got an instant building. Now, I'm going to say that that there, as, as these other buildings are a bit later, you know, these are a bit later, but then again, there's not really much difference in design anyway. And what I'm going to say, what ain't broken, what ain't broken, um, you don't need to repair it. So you just sort of keep building in a similar way over that length of time. And sort of what what we do find over time is is that uh, the pottery starts to advance, and we start to get into Bronze Age pottery. Um, their Bronze Age is sort of slightly similar to ours, um, and all this type of pottery that sort of takes us into more recent times, over the past thousands rather than uh, four or five thousand years ago. Back to these posts. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to tell you about the fascinating timeline of, of Switzerland and or do I look at an article of the week first let's do that timeline and let's do the article of the week if we've got time before the break and we have more gubbins and and then that that'll be us for today so if we and I'm gonna hopefully you've just had a load of images in front of you which is good and yeah, somebody did it to me the other day. They said, oh, I've been sitting here listening to your lecture. Uh, why have we been looking at the same image for the past 10 minutes? I thought, oh. <laughs> why? I'm being haunted by goth every time that happens. Every single time. Um, I think it's proof that he actually fell asleep in that lecture, folks. Nothing more, nothing less. So... What what we what we do find is well we do find the history of Switzerland is as fascinating as our history in regards to prehistory uh, as well. And just just a quick throwaway thing, Switzerland has been um, a more or less independent sort of um, enclave clave of historical Europe since about uh, twelve ninety one. Anyway, Paleolithic now hugely massively important what we do find in switzerland is that we've got ha a hand axe that was clearly fashioned by homo erectus erect man um, an early hand axe being found in um, switzerland at a place called uh, pratel um, and that dates to three hundred thousand years ago so they've got fairly early stuff another thing as well is We've got evidence of Homo, homo um, that being Neanderthals in Switzerland uh, that gives us evidence dated back to 70 and 40,000 years ago. Very interesting stuff. Um, now, that sort of links in with our sort of uh, Neanderthal stuff in Britain from Pont Youth Cave in North Wales. If you want to say that we've got um, Cro-Magnon man, otherwise known as Homo sapiens sapiens, sort of the way we sort of developed as we are today from all those strains of um, sort of hominids in Europe. We've got evidence back to about 30,000 years ago. And what we do find is that with everything going on, we, we start to find very rich evidence from the Mesolithic period as well, going back 12,000 years ago. Again, our Mesolithic, uh, uh, 10,000 10, years ago, um, rather than 12,000 years ago. So what we, what we see massively interesting enough to us is that 
well before us, well before us, um, but similar to my timeline, similar to my timeline, 7,000 years ago, we've got pottery being used in Switzerland, right? Which is probably a little bit before us. So we've got pottery in Switzerland. And interestingly enough, we use the word densely populated. Switzerland becomes... Um, populated by numbers of people you know that there, there are numbers of people lots of archaeological findings from their neolithic period lots going on and and the words of remains of pile dwelling dwellings have been found in the shallow areas of many lakes that's 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 correct however remains of pile dwelling buildings have been found in the shallow areas of many lakes um, they may have been found, but that doesn't mean to say that they, do, that they were always there. So that's a bit of a, um, that just sort of throws you off the scent, doesn't it? That sort of really throws you away. And then what we've got, uh, we, we've got um, their sense of the Copper Age. Uh, we've got their sense of the Copper Age, sort of similar to ours, about uh, um, roughly uh, around 2000 uh, 500 years BC, 4,500 years ago. So their copper age is about the same timeline as ours. So this is all. This is all the way we start to see the development in the likes of Switzerland. And in that in that vein, um, just around before that, we see Otzi the Ice Man. So you know we see a bit of that within the Alpine range. And what we do see is that their eruption of their sort of their Iron Age is basically the same time as ours. So we start to see um, iron being utilised and used and manufactured uh, iron um, metallurgy going on in Switzerland um, as far back as 750 years uh, BC, 2,750 um, years ago. So th this sort of gives you a little bit of a, a timeline within Switzerland and then just a thing and everything develops sort of in the iron age um as as we go through um lots of evidence of burials and so on and and just sort of really interesting thing is that we've got um we've got the ev evidence of the romans in switzerland as well and that that's that's rather interesting uh, by about 15 years bc uh, we do see that um, switzerland actually becomes part of the roman world and uh, you know it's, it's rather interesting to think that and we, we, there is evidence of forts and and towns and villages and various occupations within the roman era throughout switzerland so just sort of wanted to do that to sort of you know it, it's not a backwater there's a lot, lot going on in switzerland so i'm gonna i'm gonna do this article of the week and you know what we're gonna do we're gonna we're gonna share the word of this article of the week and this article of the week itself, and I, I will put this on the screen in a moment. There's a few other little ads and stuff on here. So this bit dates back to 2021, so it's very, very new. Okay, so we'll just read this out and see what, what we glimpse from this article. And then we'll sort of all bring it all together after the break with the prehistoric um, pile uh, dwellings um, that, that have got a nice considerable age to them. Um, and some say that these pile-driven dwellings date all the way back to the Neolithic period, at least 7,000 years ago. So we, we've got these dwellings going way, way back. So let's just go there and let's sort of, it actually refers to in this article as dwelling, so that's helpful. Um, oh. uh, da -da -da -da. So somebody, somebody handed, me a, handed me a book today, The Lies of Isis. And I'm thinking, right, okay, cool. Why? Um, how to make money out of nothing. Right, good. Well, you do bitcoins, don't you? Anyway, stop talking crap. Right, uh, okay, so here we go. If we go to this, we've got this article on the screen. 3,000-year-old submerged settlement discovered in Switzerland. So traces of a prehistoric pile dwelling suggest humans inhabited the lake 
Lucerne area 2,000 years earlier than previously thought. Rather, rather interesting, that. And there you go. Underwater archaeologists recovered 30 wooden poles used as supports for prehistoric pile dwellings. And again, Lake Lucerne. I've discovered the remains of a submerged Bronze Age village. Bronze Age, not as early as the ones that we're going to talk about, but a Bronze Age village. So we know when our Bronze Age is, about 4,000 years ago. In this one, I think it's saying 3,000 years ago. The new finds suggest that the area around the lake was settled 2,000 years earlier than previously thought, because the evidence that they found is within the lake that nobody's chosen to look before, which was part of land before then. So though researchers have long searched for, for proof of early habitation in the CERN region, a thick layer of mud had obscured traces of the village until recently. Uh, again, muddy lakes. Uh, statement from the local government, uh, con construction of a pipeline at Lake Lucerne offered underwater archaeologists a chance to e examine the lake bed up close. So the first dive, December 2019, and that uh, pointless pandemic, and we've got more results coming back in February 2021. The team recovered about 30 wooden poles and five ceramic fragments. At a depth, really interestingly, this, really interestingly enough, I, don't, I haven't actually read this article, so let's just see where it's going to go with this. So these were 13 feet in depth in the lake, right? Is this going to be... Is this going to be evidence of the water level rising in the lake or did they actually live on the lake? What's it going to say? These new finds from Lucerne Lake Basin confirm that people settled here as early as 3,000 years ago. With this evidence, the city of Lucerne suddenly becomes around 2,000 years older than has been previously proven. Experts use radiocarbon analysis to date the artifacts in the lake to 1,000 years BC, the Bronze Age, when the lake level was more than 16 feet lower than it is today, right? So in other words, in other words, um, they're finding them at 13 feet depth and the lake level was 13 feet lower than it is today. According to the statement, these conditions formed an ideal, easy accessible settlement around the lake basin. So in other words, they weren't underwater back then. They didn't build them within the lake. They actually built them on the lake side. Love it. The team identified the wooden sticks. Wooden sticks, look at that. Wooden posts, come poles, let's just give it some decorum there. Found at the site as, as supports used in pile dwellings. I'm not going to put houses on sticks, are you? Um, or prehistoric coast, coastal houses that stood on stilts. I, I, I think that's amazing you use the word prehistoric coastal houses. It makes you think of the South Wales coastline, but no, it's coastal houses in, in regards to a lake. Love it. Dwellings of this kind common in and around the Alps between Three, between 7,000 and 2,500 years ago. Um, gives us um, a new insight. There you go. It, it, it's so far out. You know, it's just like you're thinking, well, so so in other words, the point, another point to be made here is, is that archaeologists hadn't found anything in Lucerne that predated Lucerne uh, beyond 1,000 years ago because the village was actually submerged. And that's why they moved further inland and they kept moving, 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 moving. And you can probably see that, that they kept moving to um, higher, higher areas. And um, may maybe Lucerne is like the Venice of, of Switzerland, uh, that water levels are gonna keep, keep rising, aren't they? They, they, they are, because that's what happens with when ice melts. Um, the wood is very soft on the outside and hard on the inside. Um, so something like that is typical of prehistoric piles. So soft on the outside and hard on the inside, right? You know, Goff is the reserve, reverse of that. He's hard on the outside, but soft as a, a nice fluffy um, um, strawberry center. Isn't that right, Goff? Um, oh. So you know, something like this is typical of prehistoric piles. But now the scholars research is limited to the trench surrounding the underwater pipeline. But that's not we be greedy. This is great evidence, great evidence. Traces of other submerged settlements are likely hidden nearby, <laughs> but the team will need additional funding to investigate the area further. So there we go. Lake Lucerne is a 44 square mile body of water. Um, 
and it goes to a depth of 1,424 feet. Oh, my God, that's really deep, isn't it? Sort of a small mountain range in invert, in isn't it? Uh, and there we go. Um, written records indicate the humans had settled in the area in about uh, 700 years um, AD. So... Um, um, so 1300 years ago uh, but hang on that means it's it's over a thousand anyway move it. so Lake Lucerne's water level rose significantly um, in the next thousand years following the submerged village peak with a weather driven uh, increase in rubble and debris buildup at, at accelerated by medieval residents construction of water mills and other buildings the lake likely reached its current level during the 1400s according to the statement oh so the water level still isn't rising all oh, right okay right that's my naivety the archaeologist announced it coincides with the 10th anniversary of um unesco adding prehistoric pile dwellings around the alps there you go dwellings dwellings around the alps rather than uh, villages um, so what we've got, we've got the, this list of lake villages. The list includes 111 sites across Europe, including 56 in Switzerland. Um, there we go, UNESCO statement. Um, as UNESCO noted in a 2011 statement, the settlements are a unique group of exceptionally well-preserved and culturally rich archaeological sites, which constitute one of the most important sources for the study of early agrarian societies, early developing uh, societies within the region. Um, oh, she's called Isis Davis Marks. You know, when I mentioned that thing about a book, I hadn't realised her name was Isis as well. No, so somebody actually sent gave, gave me a book this morning, right, um, a, a, about the evils of Isis. Um, I don't know why they gave me that book. I'm hardly into that type of thing. Uh, I think it's to do with archaeology, actually, the, the damage that um, ISIS did um, in regards to Iraq and um, uh, Syria. So, oh, weird, strange. I probably, probably said that because uh, the name was familiar. Anyway, right, so what we're going to do, we're going we're gonna to have, we're going to have our questions and we're going to have our break. So I'm going to I'm sure I'm sure Henri wants to have something to say. Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm actually going to have a look at Henri's um, stuff in the chat box. He always puts stuff in the chat box for us all to read. Um, some reason, Mike, my end not working. Fishing lodge. Well, we'll go on to all these region, regions and that and where for all and invading Poland after the break. So we'll have a chat about that. Anything you'd like to say, Goff or Henry? Yeah. Not for me, no. Okay, uh, good. No, I think my fishing lodge one was that it just reminded me of, you know, you'd Go have a, a lodge built on the side of um, a water area and you'd use it in a seasonal fashion. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly, because in the, in the winter months it'd be frozen over, wouldn't it? I presume. Yeah. I presume, I presume, I presume the Swiss lakes freeze in the... the, the uh, uh, the winter months. I'm presuming that. I'm not exactly sure they do, but I'm presuming. So that yeah. was just that was just an observation rather than a full blown village. Can I, can I can I just mention something as well? Right, this is a very very important point. If you build these pile driven uh, driven structures on a lake that freezes, right, um, the, 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 the 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 that dwelling's not going to last long, is it? Because um, ice expands and it would just be a simple matter of um, it, it would just the whole thing would collapse, wouldn't it? Potentially, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's another reason to say that they, they did never built these things on the lakes in the first place. There's no real evidence to say that at all. Uh, but yeah, fishing lodge just alongside, just, 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 just by the water there, just a little bit. So it said so timbers don't freeze. Good. Love it. Yeah. So, uh, all, all right, then we'll, 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 we'll take a little break and, uh, and uh, we'll be back at um, 11, 11.44, I think. <laughs> right. We'll see you then. Okay. Okay, I'm just going to turn this doodah dude. Excellent.
I heard a little rumour go. Pardon? I heard a little rumour go. Yeah. Well, uh, apparently, right, apparently it's, it's, it's got through to um, to Jim, right? So you don't like him. So what's happened? He suggested, right, if he, if he comes and does the online thing, right, you can go back to the class. I, I don't. It's not that I don't like him. <laughs> he's a very nice bloke, but he's a pain in the ass, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, he is. Another uh, wrong with the past. So I, you know, the thought of sitting in that um, church hall doesn't appeal to me. At the no, moment. I know. no, I know. The thing is, Goff, without you. Without you, me and Henry would be on our son. Well, I thought Jane and Alan were coming to join us, but obviously not. Well, well, um, there's been talk of there's been talk of Alan, and uh, but Jane has paid her dues anyway. It's just, just, um, yeah, she's in the middle of moving. Christ. So, the thing is, I, we haven't seen her for like uh, I don't know two months, and uh, she's she's paid it twice now, and she she. She she'll be back. So, and there was this thing about Ellen going to the Christmas meal as well. She didn't turn up with that. No, I no, no, did I? Yeah, I know. So, uh, yeah. good, good, good old thingies. Well, as long as they're, they're getting what they want at, uh, at uh, that's true. That's fine, isn't it? They get what they want, yeah. Give them what they want. Absolutely. As they would say, Goff, take it like a man. <laughs> that's, that's what I used to say when I went to sea. <laughs> right. <laughs> did you, uh, you got my text, did you, from the, uh, the, Guard, the articles in The Guardian? Yeah, I did. Quite interesting, isn't it? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna get that back up on the screen. Because no. um, they do quite <laughs> a bit, don't they? The Guardian, they seem to. It, it's, it's, it's usually, it's usually better stuff. So here we go. Um, yeah, the world of Stonehenge, and we've got how, how is, how science is uncovering the secrets of Stonehenge. So. Um, that's actually oh my! This is actually quite a spectacular image on here. Actually, even if I just show this, um, just show the image. Actually, that that that'll be good. Um, let's get that on there. It's actually it's a really 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 nice image they've got on you. That's spectacular, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah. And that's got to be very recent as well, I would say. Oh, I don't know. No, there's frost on, there's frost on the ground, Goff. Yeah. So I, I would say that's been in the past few weeks. We're, we're fascinated by Stonehenge, aren't we, here in this country? Yeah. The thing that's, is... It's big news. Because it's so it's it, it's not just that golf. It's just it's so unique. Yeah. There's nothing else like it, and that this is the mystery. It's just almost as if um, it's just happened. There, there there may be other sites like this that we don't know about, but not standing above ground. So. Um, yeah, it, it's talking about a major exhibition at the British Museum, um, and it's talking about how how 
um, important the site is. Um, and here we go. Uh, we'll just, just read this bit. I was thinking about the ancient magic of those finds and their more spectacular counterparts while driving across Salisbury Plain early one morning last week. In the company of Neil Wilkin, the curator of the British Museum's World of Stonehenge show, with a trace of moon still evident, a thin mist lying in the valleys like it, and the morning light, that, that ties in with the image, doesn't it? Uh, just beginning to ink in the curves of hills. This landscape can hardly have changed. The A303 is firing and firing ranges apart since the blue stone and sarsen boulders of the monument were first raised. The 3,000 square miles of Salisbury Plain is the largest area of chalk grassland in Northern Europe. Its rolling flatness and enormous skies demand some vertically, uh, demand some vertically like the surface of the moon demanding a flag. Stonehenge is among other things, a monument that gives a sharp sense of identity to the landscape around it. And uh, as, as you just said, um, as an identity to ourselves, uh, <coughs> Lots of obviously other things in this, these, these carved balls that they, they, they found in Scotland, Towie balls, but nice, nice one that. Yeah, I do agree. I do agree. They get nice little articles like that. So, so what we're going to do, we're going to, uh, we're going to, well, we have, we have cracked on anyway. And let's, let's talk about where we were. And we've done that. And if we go there. Just, just think. This harks back to that first day that we that we were doing this. Can you remember back in that shed in September, Goff? Yes. Yes. Yep. I, I didn't have a clue how to share images on the screen, but we did it, didn't we? We found it. We worked it out. We did it together. That was good. Yeah. Great. So. Yeah. Love it. I love it. We're all the way there. So. What we're going to do now, I want to prehistoric pile dwellings. So from the, the word dwellings has come from the word village, really, um, in that uh, we've realised that they're more dwellings rather than whole villages. And these settlements themselves are very early for continent, uh, northern Western Europe in that they date to establish little dwellings dating back to at least 7,000 years ago. And these types of sites, as we've already said, we know of 56 of them in Switzerland, but we also know of um, them in Italy, Germany, France, Austria and Slovenia. So they are about. And what, what we do find is that the ones in Switzerland are more numerous. Excavations have been conducted at these sites, yielding various evidence of a prehistoric timeline going all the way into our Neolithic period, into our Bronze Age period and beyond. And, um, and these, these buildings actually date into the Iron Age as well. And, and in many ways, the ones that we find in the lakes have, have, have obviously been victims of the rising of the water level and inevitably very, very well preserved, giving us an idea of the agricultural um, movement and changes of people inhabiting these areas um, and again we said at the beginning contrary to popular belief the dwellings were not erected over water but on um, dry land or marshy land nearby being set on piles and this is the thing you see this is one thing that we haven't haven't discussed and it might be wise to before we sort of go on and we, we have a little look more about the, the information, I need to get a little image up on the screen, that image that shows a building on dry land. So what we've got to think about is, were they placed on piles to protect against flooding? Um, and, and the one thing that we do struggle with is the reconstructions of them being created that actually offer them as being on lakes rather than the one that we're going to actually look at. Let's have a little look, a little more look at this image that we saw earlier on. And let's just sort of see um, if we can get a little bit of discussion going over what's going on with, with these buildings. 
we've mentioned fishing house and one against flooding. So now I'm I'm one for civilization. I'm one for humanity. My um, I'm more of a, a, a feminine thinker when it comes to archaeology. Well, not feminist, but I'm a feminine thinker. I'm a practical thinker when it comes to archaeology. I'm a post-processionist archaeologist where, where, I, where I want to examine things and I want to understand them a bit more. and I want to sort of process this and that. Now, before the break, um, Henry said, you know, that, that it would make a good fishing, um, a good house for fishing in the summer months. But then again, when you think about it, these people needed somewhere to live in the winter months as well. And um, if they're actually on the lake, then we've got those problems that we mentioned, that being on top of a lake might cause the buildings just to sort of, with the pressure of the ice, to just collapse. Anyway, that said, we that said that most of them were originally on dry land. Now, were they for defence? Well, when you think about a building like this for defence, all you need to do is is set light to it. So it's not really going to be defensible. And seeing as it's not on a lake. Um, the other thing as well is the other thing that, that springs to mind as somebody that, that keeps animals. Uh, th all the buildings that I build are actually on stilts because um, it's, it, it's basically a hilly landscape here. So everything's on stilts. Nothing's cutting to the ground. Everything's on stilts. And the first thing that I know of, when you've got things on stilts, it creates shelter. And animals love things raised off the ground. They will just congregate underneath it. I know that sounds too obvious, but it's not. It's not as obvious as you think. So it's good shelter for animals. It's good shelter for storage. It's good shelter against flooding. Um, if this was a little bit nearer the lake, you could do a bit of fishing. It's good shelter to store a canoe actually underneath as well. So it's not washed away when, when the water levels have risen. And you just think that actually being raised... Um, you've got the problem of dampness to going away. You know, th there's no problem with damp. So in other words, if you've got little lambs and you've got little um, uh, little chicks and stuff, as long as you've got a really insulated level, you can sort of put wattles above this. You can put a clay layer. You can put wattles. It'll keep the cold out. You know, everything will be fine. Like it, it ties in. And it would be really insulated and dry. And actually... If it's raised above the ground anyway, you've got the flow of air keeping any dampness away as well. So that's really good. And it's raised. You've got um, it's people know where you are. And it, there's lots of reasons why you might have a raised building. And I think I think it's sort of food for thought. So we're going to keep that in our minds there. And so when we get to the end, we can see if there's any questions on it. I, I, I like the idea that. I like the idea that people have gone out of their way and reconstructed these um, in, as we know, mainly the wrong way. Um, and personally, personally, I would like to know whether this does work or not. And you can see that this building's been standing a while. It does work, doesn't it? Because it's still there. So it, it, it does make you it does make you ponder. And actually, it turns it turns it around, doesn't it? So, ninety percent of the evidence tells us that none of these were built on lake uh, the lakes at all. We're going to use a little margin of error there that all the archaeological evidence tells us that they're made on land, but we'll say that maybe one or two were actually made on the lakes. And then the question is: forget about the ice problem. I'm presuming that these lakes freeze, right? If they never froze. Um, why didn't they build them like this? And also the other point as well is, folks, you know that idea that the lake's freezing, right? Um, and it's going to cause the buildings to collapse. Well, surely the lakes freeze today, don't they? So why haven't these buildings collapsed anyway? It might be to do with the fact that if you look at that, there's all these piles, there's loads of them. There's loads and loads of piles. So in other words, if you get... Um, if you get a big space, like a meter space, you've got a lot of ice and it can expand and detract, right? But if you've got all these posts, it sort of breaks up the uh, the ability for the ice to freeze, um, and that might be that might be a good instrument for these buildings to be on the lakes. But but the question is, right? The big question is, why didn't our ancestors build them on the lakes? That's a that's a good question, isn't it? Why didn't they? 
because most of the evidence say that they didn't build them on the lakes, but they build them on lakes elsewhere. That's a really interesting question. Why didn't they, right? Why can't this be right? Most of it isn't right, but really good question there. So what we're going to do, we're going we're gonna to move on and we're going to stop sharing. I want to read some more of my text. And we're going to go with that. I'm going to delete that. And so here we go. I've got a big list of when these when these buildings uh, were constructed in front of me, and you know, there's quite a lot of them spread all the way over uh, the Swiss landscape associated with these lakes. And there's there's lots of different dates for these. Um, going back, some go back, um, some go back six thousand years, others go back seven thousand years ago. Most of the ones on this list go back six thousand years. So we, we've got a lot of these associated with this landscape six um, and some seven thousand years ago. So that's absolutely fab. I've got one last article I want us to look at today, and it'll probably be a, an earlier finish today because we actually did start off a lot earlier than than um, than normal. So here we go. Let, let's sort of think about this. This sort of ties it all together. So what, what I think we're doing is we're re-establishing these lake buildings within the rich archaeology of the world. And we think about 150 years ago. 150 years ago, decades and decades ago, 150 years ago, the first settlements were actually found. The first buildings of these, they call them the lake dwelling peoples, emerged from Lake Zurich. The, the discovery gave Europeans a new insight into the lives of their ancestors. It may have been wrong back then, but um, it's given you another perspective. So just about just about 15 years ago they had they had a massive exhibition looking at these buildings and new concepts of understanding these buildings the first one the first structure was found in the winter of 1854 and in 1854 in the winter um it, it, this is this is difficult to try and work out in 1854 in the winter there was an exceptionally low water level um, within Lake Zurich. So usually water level rises in, in the winter elsewhere, but in obviously here it, it, the water level dropped. Quite by chance, quite by chance, they actually found that there was timber sticking out, as we've illustrated earlier on. And the excavations unearthed a number of odd-looking, superbly preserved ancient artefacts and a series of wooden poles embedded in the mud. And then immediately people started to say that people lived on the lake uh, within this lake village. So they put various theories were put forward in 1854. And the main theory by a chap by the name of um, Ferdinand Keller, he said that the theory he put forward was that people had lived on platforms above the water because of all the posts sticking up. They said that they were connected to dry land by bridges and walkways. Well, actually, with that one illustration that we've actually seen with a walkway from a bank out a little bit further and you've got a building which is on dry land. Uh, well, the bridges and walkways are there, but the interpretation was slightly different because of the water level. After the discovery, and yeah, that's what I'm going to say. Um, when they were ex excavating these buildings and the muds, muds and stuff, uh, the interesting thing is, is that that level where they're finding the timbers would probably not been far off the original level that they were actually constructed in in the first place. Obviously drier, but obviously the water level had dropped. After the discovery of this one, one, one set of buildings, build, uh, a building built there over a long period of time, hence the idea of the village that we discussed at the beginning. After the discovery of similar settlements on other Swiss lakes, the legend of the lake dwellers was born. Sorry. So soon it had fired Europe's imagination. Articles 
in newspapers, exhibitions, historical paintings, novels, public events, and so on, fueled the legend of the lake dwellers. So, well, you could say it's sort of right because they lived alongside the lake anyway. In subsequent decades, hundreds of lake buildings have been discovered across the world of Europe, as we said, France, Slovenia, Austria, Switzerland. In recent decades, modern scientific analysis and dating techniques have revealed that the villagers were rather less exotic, exotic than what was bestowed on them in the, uh, in the um, 1854. And when we, when we say less exotic, the, these were just small buildings alongside the lakes rather than actually on them. And the evidence takes us back way beyond six, six and a half thousand, seven thousand years ago. The individual buildings or uh, more than one building, because there would be places where there'd be more than one building, but rather than the village, the settlements were actually built on, on land, usually in marsh areas. At the time, the water levels in the lakes was much lower, as we've said, than it is today, up to 15 feet low, lower in some places, as we've already said. Um, and the other thing as well is what they, what they are saying is that they were individual buildings. Um, or if they weren't individual buildings, there weren't platforms around them. So you, you'd go, you'd go on a ramp and you go directly into the building rather than sort of a veranda around the outside, which is rather interesting as well. That you actually go into the building. There's nothing around it. You just go into it. It's on stilts. That's what you're talking about. Um, so these buildings stood apart from one, other, one another rather than being on a big shelf, a big raised platform, as we would say with um, with some of the lake villages in, in South, um, Central and South America, um, where you've got um, lake village built on, on reed sort of areas and you've got buildings on top of it. So very different from that. Hundreds of poles sunk into the mud over a long period of time. Even today, um, even today, the, the events of, of 1854 are still considered a watershed for European archaeology. Suddenly we're finding archaeology that's very, very ancient, painting a new picture of the archaeology within Europe. Until then, the archaeological investigation of prehistory had, had brought to light almost nothing except symbols of death, such as graves, weapons, and military sites. So in other words, when you, when you think about it, people are uh, interested in burial chambers, particularly in Britain. They're not really interested in the archaeology of the sites they actually lived in. And this has been a huge problem within archaeology over the years. For example, people looking at Roman sites, they look at the Roman military sites and um, until over the recent decades, they, they started to focus on civilian sites. It's the same as ancient Egypt. We, we think of maybe they used to say that the pyramids at Giza and, and the 80 odd, 90 odd pyramids throughout Egypt, 90 pyramids, um, were all built using slaves until they started looking at the villages, knowing that the villages were actually living quite a good life and they were in the service of the king rather than slaves. So, so this is this is a very important thing. So until the 1850s, people were just interested in other things, you know, finding a weapon, a sword. They might think, oh, there's people fighting, killing each other and so on. This, this is this was the preconception of, of the past. Now everything's changed. So these buildings themselves and the objects that they yielded provided the first evidence to enable scholars to understand how people actually lived, not how they died. Above all the lake dweller finds opened up a new historic vision of Switzerland as it did for other European countries. Suddenly history, now this is in interesting, suddenly history no longer began with the Romans. History was far older than that. And that's a really important point. I, I know that there's somebody who watches these videos on a regular basis and he keeps saying, oh, you know, you're obsessed with the Romans, Carl. Well, that's how I make my money, right? Oh, well, one of the ways, because I sell books on the Romans. But the fact of the matter is, um, the, you know, everything existed before the Romans and civilization existed before the Romans. And this is what these lake villages in Switzerland offered us. And this is why we're doing prehistory now is because there's so much to learn from prehistory over the many months that we'll be doing this. The lake settlements demonstrated the existence of skilled, intelligent people before the Roman era. In short, they gave the people of Switzerland new consciousness of their own origins. So in other words, it just didn't start with the Romans, it started far, far back. And this could be seen as a political tool. The legend of the lake dwellers was an ideal tool to bind together a still fragile nation. Um, 
And when you think about it, even though Switzerland has been around since um, the, the, the 1200s, um, it didn't form as, an, as a completely independent away from everybody else until 1848. Um, and interesting enough to actually have origins associated with these dwellers on the lakes makes the, the Swiss people um, have a very different um, cultural um, a co cultural way of looking at things. They're, they're very, very different than everywhere else. It was no co coincidence that in 1867 uh, that, um, that people started to um, paint and to sort of reconstruct these types of villages in an art form. Quality, the archaeological success of the lake dwellers had a lot to do with the incredible high quality of the finds. And what we've got is that they, they've got the, the, the way that they lived, the way they were able to fell down trees can be seen in the artifacts that we found. They were very advanced. And later on, we see the very rich pottery that we just sort of glimpsed upon earlier on. Contrary to popular belief, water conserves materials perfect, uh, perfectly, provided they're kept out of contact with the air. Um, and this was the, the, the evidence that we found in the first um, lake settlement site of Millen. Um, and the evidence there was buried under um, sands and muds within the lakes for generation after generation. Generally, archaeologists are left with objects made of metal, stone, terracotta or, or glass from which an interpretation of the past is made. But in regards to the lake, some very important archaeological evidence was found. But the lake dweller finds include various organic uh, materials not just organic materials of wood, but um, other uh, wooden carved objects, hazelnuts, um, other food that they dried, including evidence of dried apples, spices, and carved resins, giving you a great understanding of the life and dietary habits of these people. Now, you know, earlier on, I mentioned, I, I mentioned in regards to some of these lake settlements on how, how they disappeared and how they ended so on on the um, on the basically the 160 60th plus anniversary of the discovery of the first settlement the the dwellers of the of the lakes from switzerland at melon um, um swiss archaeologists uh, are warning that the growing urbanization of the lake shore and above all population of destroying um are going to start to destroy the archaeology within in, within the lakes because you know um, there's a lot more um, reclamation of lakesides to build and, and reclamation of the lakesides is where these buildings to be found so we've got to have that uh, um, method and warning from the past countless objects will remain hidden under the lake shore um, a literal treasure trove of information about our history which which we need to really uh, which we need to really understand. And understanding what's still there will help us understand um, why people moved away from these areas, why, why, why things changed. And that could be a little bit of a discussion when we, when we finish this little bit now, because we're nearly at the end. So countless objects are still there to be discovered. One question still to be answered is why the lake dwellers cho chose to live within the environments that they lived. Um, and... It, it's, you know, they, they, they could have not lived near the lakes. They could have lived elsewhere. They, they could have built very different structures, but they did actually build these structures. And, and maybe we, we won't ever understand why these buildings were abandoned because they moved elsewhere. Maybe they, they just decided to build towns and those towns themselves had stone footings and those stone footings can be built on a timber, a pile driven structure just near the lakeside. So it, it, it's it, people change. Pe people altered their, their ways of life, like people alter their ways of life today. For example, um, I've never been happy living in a house and um, I'm building a roundhouse with electricity, gas, water, a shower um, raised off the ground with a really nice roof light and warmer than any house that you two are living in. But the fact of the matter is, I'm using modern technology to build something using old technology. And that's the way forward. That's the way I, that's the way I, I, I see things. 
However, um, you know, things always change in history. And um, by looking at the past helps us understand the future. By looking at understanding why people moved away from these lake villages, these lake buildings, these, these lake settlements, these lake structures, will help us understand um, ways of moving into a very busy and bustling, uh, possibly, hopefully positive future. So what we're going to do, I want to just, just show that um, last image, um, that one image that, it, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to try and get some other images up on the screen. Okay, let's just sort of um, lake village, vi uh, lake villages, um, it's still called lake villages when you do a search, when well, we know they're not villages, but um, Switzerland, if we could do in Switzerland. And... Unfortunately, I didn't put the word prehistory in there, did I? I need to put prehistoric because I've got all the villages that still stand there. Prehistoric. Here we go. Let's see if we can find some. Oh, oh, there's a beautiful reconstruction here. Um, now, right, let's let's go with this. Right, this is sort of how they thought that this looked in 1854 um, when, when it was being found. So let's just get on to this. Just look on some some of these images. Um, and screen and start. Good. Um, finger. There. Now we know that they didn't look like that, right? But but obviously this is to this is to broadcast um, a perception of the past. And it's really interesting that you've got. You've got round houses and square and rectangular buildings. We know this is wrong now, but we do know that um, little little elements of this are correct, that we've got buildings built on piles. So that, that's that's correct. Um, more sort of illustrations there. Um, and actually, um, J.R.L. Tolkien based um, the Hobbit villages uh, the Hobbit towns, um, based on the evidence that was found on the Swiss lakes. But obviously, as we know now know, um, the Hobbit is fiction, and it was built based on fictitious accounts of the archaeological excavations from 1854, which is which is fine. Um, and so we've got that there. Yeah, so very, very different from this, what we're seeing. And look at that there. Now, this is this is a really interesting one where you've got all these piles and you can understand why the archaeologists felt that the villages themselves, uh, that it was actually part of a village, but there is an individual building. And that's probably close closest to where we need to be. That looks like a really good reconstruction. That looks really, really good. Um, that's probably more in the vein of what we're talking about. And, and there's actually no, there's no causeway leading out to that. Probably just steps going up. Steps would have been a revolution as well. Um, let's just, uh, yeah, there's another little one there where they're actually showing it sort of in the marshy areas. I think what they've done, they, they, they've done a lot of experimental stuff here. Um, They've done a lot of experimental stuff, which I think is great. I, I, you know, I'm not going to fault this. I, I think experimental stuff is is good. So I'm just going to see if we've got any artifacts as well, and just um, probably end on that as well. Ah, right. Oh God, there's, there's everything going on here. Um, oh, oh, right. Okay. There we go. So what what we've got? We've got. Um, and uh, it's saying social inequality left its mark on a 5,000 year old Alpine village. Do you know what we're going to do, Goth? Do you see the word guardian there? This is for you. Let's just have a little read of this one. Swiss unearthed 5,000 year old door. Yes, guardian. Archaeologists find remarkable Neolithic wooden door as old as Stonehenge. Oh my God, there's a link there. This, I can't make this up. So we've got the Guardian, you mentioned, then we've got Stonehenge, that article is great. Here we go. As a site of a planned car park in Europe. Here it. Look how well preserved that is. Isn't that absolutely amazing? A door. Whole door. 5,000 year old door. Um, the ancient popular wood door is solid and elegant with well 
preserved hinges. Are you seeing this, guys? Yeah. Good. And a remarkable design for holding boards together. So there we go. Wow. So it's all been sort of bound together or whatever way it's looking at. Using tree rings to determine its age. The archaeologist um, Belcher believes the door could have been made in 3063 BC on the 14th of August of 515. <laughs> How the hell has he got such a precise date? That's amazing. The door is very rem remarkable. Uh, because of the way the planks were held together. I know how we got the date, guys. Because the date was on the door. That's how. <laughs> they knew it. Harsh clima climatic conditions at the time meant people had to build solid houses that would keep out, out much of the cold wind that blew across Lake Zurich. Do you know what? That's the reason then, isn't it? To keep out the cold. Keep out the cold. Um, and the door would have helped. It's a clever design that even looks good. The door was part of a settlement of so-called stilt houses, frequently found near lakes about a thousand years after agriculture and animal hus husbandry uh, were introduced to the area. And uh, it's similar to a door found in um, Fikul, Fikin, Fikon, uh, while a third made from one solid piece of wood is believed to be even older possibly 5,700 years old. The latest door was found at the dig um, associated with a car park. So here we go. I don't know what that is there. Archaeologists found traces of at least five Neolithic villages believed to have existed at the site uh, between 3,700 and 2,500 years BC, including objects such as flint, flint dagger from what is now uh, Italy, an elaborate hunting bow. And then what we're going to do, we, we started off that today. There we go. Love it. There we go. The door there. And then finally, we'll just have a little look at some artifacts. Um, that's that's Must Farm. That's in, um, that that's uh, Peterborough, that one. That's not, that's not one of those. Um, and then finally, a load of artifacts. There we go. So we've got lots of um, loom weights there. Um, just there on the left um, and we've got um, antlers uh, we've got a little bowl there uh, we've got we've got flints so this is probably a collection from roughly about 4,000 years ago and we know it's a collection from about 4,000 years ago or maybe four and a half thousand years ago because those there are copper axes so that'd be the copper age about four and a half thousand years ago so what we've got we've got a collection this may have all been going at the same time with print arrowheads uh, and you've got that there might actually be a baton. Um, I think it's called a baton de cord, where you where you actually use it to sling um, sling a spear. That's what you might use that for. You um, um, spear slinger. That's what they believe anyway. Some archaeologists. All these flints, all these artifacts associated with these buildings. A nice little bowl there. Really nice assemblage of artifacts there. Oh, there's a boar's tusk there on the right as well. So really, really great stuff. So what we're going to do, folks, right? What we're going to do, um, we're going to get we're going to get straight down to um, our undies, um, and there's some stuff that isn't relevant there, um, but there we go. That's that. So what we're going to do, we're going to go, we're going to see now. We're going to stop the sharing. Are there any questions? Sharing is caring, as you know, guys. Anything you want to ask, Henri? Um, I Another thought for raising, obviously, you mentioned the cattle underneath, um, but I think I said, sent you a message saying, would that not heat the, um, the floor above? Oh, my God, what a legend. Um, cattle could provide heat to, to floor above. Do you know what? Stop there a minute. Do you know what? Um, I, use, I usually remember most of the things said in a previous lecture, and I use that information to enhance what we're doing today. That was one thing that somebody said on Tuesday. I think that was the only thing that, that was said on Tuesday that I haven't mentioned. Um, what, that was mentioned on Tuesday, and I, and I think we ran out of time, actually, and I didn't discuss it. And the way I would discuss that was when you go to Cosmeston Medieval Village and you've got a building called the Buyer, um, and, and what you've got, you've got a building which has got a big open area down below, and above it there's like um, uh, there's a shelf, um, and that's where people would have lived. They would have lived directly above the animals. So the animals themselves would have kept the people warm uh, because of the heat down below. 
And cattle do give off a lot of heat, but they also give off, my, my French, a lot of shit. Now, um, one reason why we've got a huge problem in the medieval period in Britain is because from the 1300s, people have moved, have moved from sheep rearing um, and goat rearing and pig rearing, uh, where pigs could just roam around in a wood. They, they've, they've gone directly onto cattle. Cattle carry anthrax and very horrible diseases. And what they found is because the people live in close proximity with cows, they, they were very much prone to getting anthrax rather than the cattle in a shed over there. And that was simply because the cattle lived with the people. Yeah, that's a very, very good point. Um, and do you know what? In that article that, we just, that we've just done, none of the articles said anything about... Actually, I, I put all the stuff about cold and stuff in myself, but uh, with the winter months, but I haven't actually used the word cold until now, just a few moments ago. And that idea, because the landscape is going to be very, very cold... Um, to have these raised off the ground and gr the ground would be quite cold, but obviously you're raising the buildings. But if you have, have everything insulated and, and everything's really well put together, um, that's going to have advantages. So I, I think that that's a good take on that. So anything else you'd like to say, Henri? I, I think the only other observation would be um, building on land is a lot easier than trying to build actually in a lake. So that concept of actually them actually just building in the lake, you know, the, the yeah. physical engineering of that is quite immense. Uh, well, actually, actually, you are very right. Um, when, when, when I started building things here, I, I was doing the usual thing, thinking I knew it all and I didn't. And, um, and I, and, um, you know, and, and I was just, I was just thinking, all oh, right, I use a level and all the rest of it. Nothing ever worked. And I thought, sod this, I'm just going to use line of sight and I'm going to do this. And the buildings have worked out a lot better um, than using conventional tools, um, particularly when I'm doing it myself. And um, when you think about building on a lake, you've got, you've got no idea of anything. Um, you don't know what's, and, and as soon as you put a stake into the mud, everything's going to be all over the place. You can't find stones and, and, all, and all the rest of it. And, and, I, and, and it's going to be cold, and there's only going to be certain times that you can build, and there's only going to be certain times of the year you're going to maintain. Well, build, but they did build on water and those cranogs and all the rest of it. And this instant, they didn't. They didn't, right? And that question that I had earlier on, more or less all the evidence tells us that they didn't actually build directly on top of the lake, but we got people building directly. For example, Dublin, when we start to see the, the building of the Vikings at Dublin, they're, they're just building structures that are um, above the low water level. And then you've got all the crap building up and you've got the Cranogs in Scotland and Ireland and Wales and so on and so on. Um, we know that people are building on lakes, but they're not doing it in Switzerland, right? And they, they're telling us something that we don't understand. And maybe just what you've just said just answers it, because the past is not as complicated. The past is only a postcard away. Um, um, the, the past is to be seen um, in time um, travelled, um, not in distance of time. Um, we will get sometimes get those answers, um, but on this one, um, they didn't build on the lakes, and that's a very impressive um, enigma for an important statement. So there we go. There See, we go. Do you know, do you know, you you have this, you have this, um, and, um, and 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 um, and God. Anything you would like to say? Oh, it's very good, but I, I did a quick Google in the break. And, uh, the lake, some lakes in Switzerland do freeze over. Ah, uh, some. Some. Now, it would be interesting to work out the correlation. Now, oh, God, that, that would be a correlation, isn't it? The ones that freeze over, but then again, we don't have the buildings on the lake, so do we? But um, the correlation would be, are there more uh, lake... Are there more of these um, structures found um, alongside lakes that freeze than don't freeze? Yeah, well, the other question is that was, that's now. Yes, what that's now, yeah. Oh! Climate-wise, you know, so. Yeah, I, I've fallen for that myself. Yeah, that's now, right, yeah. So that, we don't... That really is... Yeah. Well, we know lakes freeze over because I know the Great Lakes freeze over, so 
I presume. Yeah. 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 Anyway, they, great. Very good. Thanks. They, they are funding and all the rest of it. Yeah, that's a good question. I just jumped in there then, didn't I? And, and maybe they, they never froze or they did. Or or maybe that's the reason why they didn't. Yeah, so that, that's back to what we said. Maybe that's the reason why they didn't build on them because they froze. Right, okay then. Um, I'm just going to do a reminder. Thanks for that, Goffman and Henry. Next week, we're going to be looking at the footprints and we're going to be looking at some more dating stuff. Um, are there any questions from you, Goff and Henry, before we finish today? No, no thank, thank you. you. Okay, Goff and Henry, I'll say goodbye. Bye bye. Um, see you next week. Take care, Catherine Henry. Bye. Have a good bye -bye. week. Bye bye. Au revoir, mon petit <laughs> Enjoy yourself. I, I will. I will. I will. I will. Take care, my friend. Oh, bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. There we go. Um, thanks for watching today. We've we that was that was good. And we'll, we'll just I'll just finish. I'm I'm a bit tired actually. I don't know. I'm. I'm I got really warm then and I got really cold and uh, and uh, I just got to, I think I'm going to have a little little break. Anyway, thanks for like. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for everybody watching and I'll speak to you again. Bye. See you. Mon petit bleu. Um, a little more. Bye. Like and subscribe and join. Join. That'd be great. You get some extras when you join. Join. Blue button. Join.